I'm Shahida Bari. I'm chairing this event. Is it chairing? It feels like such a delightful thing to be doing. We're going to be looking at some really beautiful images and hearing from some really fantastic speakers. So this is the event, um, Is Fashion Only French? And here we'll be examining the idea of a couture and its place in French culture, comparing it to, I think, next to London style um, and global fashions. I think we're going to be exploring lots of things. <laughs> um, uh, the internationalization of the fashion industry, ideas of sexuality and the blurring of boundaries between menswear and women's wear collections. Now, our expert speakers are Farid Chenoun uh, of the Institut Francais de la Mode. He is an independent fashion researcher, art curator, and author, and he teaches the history of fashion. And his books include Dior from Christian Dior to Ralph Simons and Carried Away, all about bags and Yves Saint Laurent. Oriel Cullen is the head of modern textiles and fashion at the Victoria and Albert Museum. She's previously worked as a curator for dress and decorative arts at the Museum of London, where she curated the London look, and most recently, if you can't tell, she's been the curator behind the major retrospective Christian Dior, designer of dreams. I'm sure some of you will have seen that. Uh, Caroline Evans is a professor of fashion history and theory at Central St. Martins, University of the Arts London. She's a leading thinker of fashion studies and her books include Fashion at the Edge, one of my favorites, 2003, um, The Mechanical Smile, and most recently Il Tempo della Moda 2019. And she's currently working on lots of things, including the idea of fashion gesture. Sophie Kardijan, uh, she's doing a PhD, she has done a PhD, exploring the history of 20th, early 20th century fashion press, and she was a visiting fellow at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, where she worked on the fashion periodicals collection, and she's been a research fellow at the Institut d'Histoire de Temps Présent in Paris, where she co-directs the history and fashion research seminar, which we all want to go to. Um, she's the creator of the French fashion research network, Culture de Mode, in collaboration with the Ministry of Culture. And last but not least, Jenny Lister is the co-creator of the V&A exhibition, Mary Quant, and editor of the accompanying catalogue. She was also behind exhibitions on Grace Kelly and 60s fashion. She's contributed to various publications and worked on many displays of the permanent fashion and textile collections at the V&A. Could you encourage them and welcome them with a warm round of applause. Thank you. So each of our speakers will have around five to ten minutes to share their thoughts on that question of whether French fashion is only French and then we'll have a general discussion and then we'll open to the floor so do um, drum up some fiendish questions. Um, fashion or otherwise, uh, uh, if the Q&A session. So let's hand over first to Oriel, um, who's going to talk about Dior, I think. Thank you. Great. So I'm going to take Christian Dior as a case study, really, um, because as Shahada mentioned, um, we have an exhibition at the v &A at the moment. And so really looking at a case study for Paris fashion over the past 70 plus years. Um, and so... The 12th of February, 1947, is a fabled moment in fashion history because at 10.30 a.m. in the morning, Christian Dior opened the doors of his couture house for the first time. And really, fashion had been in the doldrums in Paris since the, the end of the war. Everybody was really looking for something new and exciting to come from there. Um, and there was a lot of buzz about this new designer. And of course, fashion is important in France. It's very embedded in the culture. There's a wonderful industry there. To give you some idea, in 1939, at the start of the war, there were 300,000 people working in the fashion trades and ancillary industries. So really very important. And the British author, Nancy Mitford, great Francophile spoke about the fact that all of even the taxi drivers were talking about this new designer and there was a real buzz around um, this collection. So Dior delivered. Um, he came out with a new collection. He moved away from the boxy silhouettes of the war years with square shoulders and, and shorter skirts and introduced a sloping shoulder line, a tiny waist, padded hips and a skirt which fell to mid-calf length. So the fashion press were ecstatic. Um, there was wonderful reviews, and the American editor, Carmel Snow of Harper's Bazaar, coined this look the new look, um, and the name stuck. 
So there was also controversy. Um, the new look was seen as a sort of flagrant display of luxury um, in an age where there was still a lot of hardship. In Britain, the head of the Board of Trade, Sir Stafford Cripps, called in the fashion journalists and asked them not to report on this because he was worried about a run in materials. Rationing was still in place. Um, and so this was very foremost in his mind. And it's very interesting to read um, the press reports that came out of that. The V&A's fashion expert, James Laver, at the time, said that he was very worried about the longer length because it threw a focus on the ankles and feet, which were not a British woman's strong point. So, um, they, you know, in France, when Dior went on his first trip there, he arrived at the end of... Uh, 1947, he was met with protesters, uh, women with placards in Chicago, which read, Mr. Dior, we abhor your dresses to the floor. Um, so really, um, you know, mixed, re mixed responses, but very much um, an important moment, and the new look was really here to stay and would crystallize um, the, the look of fashion for the coming decade. Um, so, the look of Dior, the signature look of his house, um, was sort of coined by Vogue, um, who, who attended the first show, um, American Vogue, and they said it wasn't about an easy little dress and it wasn't about theatricality. This was about a deep knowledge of dressmaking and a sophisticated way of wearing these clothes. And for Dior, um, this look was deeply embedded in and influenced by his idea of the Parisienne. Um, and this lay in his love of the period of his early childhood childhood, which he often spoke about, the Belle Epoque, um, when Parisian society and culture sort of reached a high point of sophistication and artifice. Um, and he stated he felt so lucky to live through this time, and he recalled the elaborate clothing of his mother. You can see in the slide here above, um, on your left-hand side, Madeleine Dior. He talked about how she had these wonderful clothes and how she would um, breeze through, leaving a trail of perfume behind her. Dior's own muse was a lady called Mitza Bricard. Um, and she was kind of a mysterious character who had a shadowy past. But she had worked at the house of Molyneux, another fashion house, and Dior had, had met her when she was first there, and he was just transfixed by her. Um, she apparently lived only for elegance, um, and he talked about her sort of um, inimitable extravagances of taste and, and how that inspired him. And the Vogue editor, Bettina Ballard, said that Mitza Bricard was you know, the ultimate Parisian, down to her very soul. No one was more Parisian than Mitza. Um, so she really has a big influence on Dior and the look of fashion. In 1955, another couturier, Jacques Heim, um, he acknowledged the importance of the Parisian um, to the haute couture, and he stated, the couturier shapes the aspirations and dreams of millions of women, but from where does he get his unusual power? He draws from his experience, which is dressing the most elegant women of Paris. To them, he owes everything. So, rooted in Paris, Dior is very conscious that in order to sustain and grow his business, he really needed a global model. And he not only revolutionized fashion design, but he also was incredibly radical in his approach to business. Um, along with his business manager, Jacques Rouette, he really transformed the way fashion was done. Um, in 1948, he opened a high-end, ready-to-wear version of the Haute Couture House in New York. So this would be versions of the Paris Haute Couture pieces, but they would be retailed in specific department stores. Um, he did the same in 1952 when he opened CD models in London, um, creating um, the same and, and retailing in, in department stores such as Harrods and Kendall Milne and Marshall and Snellgrove. Um, he also opened a branch in Caracas in Venezuela. He had a branch in Casablanca in Morocco. He traveled uh, to Australia and did deals with department stores there. He also did deals with department stores in Japan. So we're really global market and opening up the haute couture to a much wider audience, albeit uh, um, you know, still a, a quite wealthy audience. Um, the brilliance lay in his approach to licensing. So he set up an unusual model whereby he would grant a license, but only for a period of one year. Um, and he would visit the factories, he would look at the standard of the, the product that was being created. And if it slipped in any way, they would revoke the licensing immediately. So with this model um, and with the couture house as a sort of jewel in his crown, Christian Dior could really play to the aspirational market in selling perfume, stockings, costume jewelry to millions of people seduced by the allure of the Paris of couture house. 
Um, by 1956, his influence um, was, you know, incredible. And you can see not only in fashion magazines, I don't know if this is um, this slide here on the left, this is from the picture post. So he, he's really looking, you know, at, at this middle market here. The picture post isn't specifically fashion, but it deals with fashion. And it's this idea of the trickle-down theory. So the picture post is saying to its readers, how many Dior lines have you worn in the last nine years? So essentially, you didn't realize it, but everything you've been wearing has been coming from Christian Dior. In 1957, Dior appeared on the cover of Time magazine. Um, sadly, that was the year that he died at the age of 52. He was just at the helm of his house for only 10 years, but he had really become a global force and a global name. Um, he was, um, his, his assistant, uh, Yves Saint Laurent, took over the, realm, the reins of the house at just 21 years of age, and he was then um, replaced by Marc Bohan at the beginning of the 1960s, and Marc Bohan had a long tenure of 29 years, and he really steered the house of Dior through a difficult period when ready-to-wear becomes the leading edge and force in fashion, and I know Jenny's going to speak to that um, later on. So... In 1984, a French businessman, Bernard Arnault, was visiting uh, New York and found himself in the back of a cab. When he mentioned he was French, the taxi driver turned to him and said, I don't speak French, but I can say Christian Dior. And Arnaud ha had realized um, you know, that, that the house was actually up for sale at the time, and Arnaud suddenly had this moment, it was an epiphany, he said he realized that you know, the power and global reach of this brand was really quite significant. So he returned to Paris and he bought the house of Dior, um, and he set about sort of changing it and modernizing it. And one of the things he did was to bring in a new designer in 1989 called Gianfranco Ferre. And there was huge consternation about this in the press because Ferre was Italian. And at the time, Italy and France were really having a standoff as to see who was you know, um, supreme in, in the fashion game. And it's very interesting to read these reports, people saying, how could an Italian take over this such an important French house? But Ferre does a very good job of it. He brings a sense of drama back to the house of Dior, and he really positions Dior back at the center of fashion um, uh, and in a really important space in, in, within the fashion media too. So following on from that, Dior has really retained um, this, this sort of space in, in fashion folklore and, 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 and positioning. Um, you know, through the years of John Galliano, these extravagant highs, um, the, the, the chic minimalism of Raph Simmons who followed him, and the very dynamic contemporary approach of Maria Grazia Curie, the, the designer who's there today. Um, so really we have an Englishman, a Belgian, and an Italian. Um, and they've all spoken of the magic of being at this fabled Parisian house to which no other can compare in terms of legacy. It is Paris, and it is fashion, I would say. And lastly, the return of Christian Dior last summer, um, another Englishman, Chris, um, Kim Jones, who took over the menswear, um, and he, he opened his show with this giant sculpture made of roses of Christian Dior and his beloved dog, Bobby. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, thank you so much, Royal. I love that the, the story of an Englishman, a Belgian, and an Italian. It sounds like a, a joke, the beginning of a, <laughs> a joke, doesn't it? And then Kim Jones at the end, who is, you know, as, mm -hmm. you know, South East London or Essex, as you can possibly imagine. That's wonderful. Um, I think I'm just going to ask you a question before we move on to Sophie, but is that, would you say there is one distinctive aspect of Dior's look and design that has contoured and shaped fash French fashion? Um, I think that the, the new look silhouette is something that ever since um, Ferre, you know, all of the designers who've come to the house, they've referenced back to that in their first collection. That's been sort of shown as the statement of intent. So really that bar suit, that first suit we saw with the white jacket and the, and the black skirt is emblematic of the house. And, and lots of the designers have referred back to this. And and translated it into, you know, incredible in different ways. But that, I think, is, is sort of the tenet of seen as Dior. And, of course, it's all about the curves. It's all about the, mm. the shape of the female body and that sort of sexuality, which is very different to, you know, the other French name we know, Chanel, designing very much mm. for her, herself. And she said in a sort of barbed comment, probably in reference to... Dior's homosexuality, you know, Christian Dior does not know women's bodies, you know, but that's quite ironic because Chanel was 
definitely designing for herself, mm. a very straight up, straight down, um, slim woman. And Dior is very interested in this, you know, this, you know, looking at the curves of the body and celebrating them. Yeah, I think anybody who goes to the show comes out, the V&A show comes out of it, being able to spot a Dior look, a <laughs> silhouette, at, you know, a hundred yards. <laughs> Let's hand over to Sophie. Yeah. Uh, yes, I will uh, use my seven minutes to talk about Paris as fashion capital and try to question this idea of Paris as, uh, the, as a fashion capital. So uh, Paris became an internationally recognized fashion capital between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. During this period, Paris developed into a cluster, a term Alfred Marshall uh, used in 1890, and Michael Porter theorized one century later. As a territory, Paris gathered couture houses, such as the one of Charles Frédéric Vort, which opened in 1858, and which uh, was at the origin of the haute couture system. Paris also gathered a uh, novelty store, department store, sorry, yes, department store, such as Le Printemps and Les Galeries Lafayette's uh, in 1854, is uh, Paris gather also fashion press editorial board, such as uh, those of Vogue, La Reine La Mode, and those fashion magazines from Paris were disseminated throughout the world. Paris also gather confection atelier, and also something very important, Paris, um, um, in Paris, uh, was created in 1868, a fashion trade union dedicated to couture. And this trade union, called La Chambre Syndicale de la Couture, and which still exists today, played a key role in the um, position of Paris as fashion capital. It contributed very strongly to the structuration of Paris at the, f at the fashion capital and structured the Paris fashion industry. As a secular country, um, France also possessed a secular know-how, which were fertile grounds for the creativity, but also specialized workers who had been trained during seven years to create original designs. Paris also had a lot of clients from the aristocracy who could afford French haute couture. So during, uh, of, over the course of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, Paris thus became the place where the actors involved in the culture joined together in order to define their specification and to fight foreign competition. During the beginning of the 20th century, fashion couturier, fashion trade union, fashion, design, uh, fashion uh, publish, uh, magazines publishers joined their force together to make Paris stronger than another city. And this effort of um, structuration of the industry played a key role in the a position of Paris on the international level. At that period, Paris was considered as the most important fashion capital in the world, and this idea of Paris fashion capital became very important for the national construction of the country until today. Buyers came into Paris, Paris each year, since the end of the 19th century, to buy Parisian design. Uh, on the other hand, Parisian couturier traveled in Europe and America, uh, North America and South Africa, to present their collection. So this idea of fashion capital can be supported also by numbers and data. Uh, for example, in 1913, but also in 1920, uh, Parisian fashion represents the second largest exports in France. So it was a very big part of uh, the fashion industry. Fashion represents a key industry and um, still today, uh, we, uh, um, the French, in, uh, the Institut Francais de la Mode uh, made a large survey two, two years ago to show this data, how, what fashion represents uh, in, the fas in the French industry in 2016. And we have the same number of the importance of the fashion industry for the French economics. So we have this idea, this strong idea, uh, can be justified by a cultural tradition of France know-how and creativity of the uh, numbers uh, and economic numbers. But what I would like to, um, what I would like also to insist, oh, to show today is that, uh, yes, this idea can be justified, but we can't, um, we can't forget 
uh, all the exchanges of ideas, style, exchanges of individuals and text, techniques that upended the history of French fashion. And in fact, of course, French fashion was a history of French and of a, of a country, but it's also a question of exchanges, of interbreedings, of multiple cultural, social, and technical exchanges. So I don't have time uh, to develop this idea of like early globalization in fashion, but I would like to take one example to illustrate this idea of uh, exchanges and not only of a French national construction. Uh, my example today concerns the human components of the Parisian fashion cluster. Following the work of Nancy Green, an historian at the OHSS in Paris, uh, who has studied the impact of migration in the ready-to-wear industry in Paris and New York, I would like to highlight the idea that migration, human migration, contributed to Paris' reputation as a fashion cluster and as a fashion capital, and that the industry itself, the fashion industry, was shaped by a large number of non-French couturiers, as you said, especially uh, for Christian Dior. Uh, and this non-French couturier moved to Paris uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and uh, contribute for a large part to the development of French fashion. This is first the case of Charles Frédéric Watt, who was a British couturier. And so we always talk about Paris fashion, but don't forget that the first one who created the system of haute couture was British. But when we think about it, there are lots of other, other couturiers uh, such as, and this is only examples because when we are in the archives, we can find other names. We have like uh, Redfern, Molineux were British. We have also the importance in, at, of Dricol, a German couture house, but also of Jean de Say, who was Greek, of Fortuny and Balenciaga, who were two Spanish couturiers and contribu contributed to the development of French fashion. We have also the role played by Nina Ricci and Elsa Schiaparelli, who were Italian. So what I want to to say is that this famous couturier that I think you know, you know most of them um, were in fact from elsewhere than France. And uh, this is also, as Nancy Green um, showed, the case of workers who worked for the confection but also for the couture industry. And who came, most of them, from the east of Europe, from Armenia, for example, because of war or economic crisis of genocide. And they came to Paris because of this old tradition of fashion, but they come to, came to Paris and um, they contributed to the fashion industry. Of course, there were workers and they worked for Couturier, but I, want, I would like to discuss with you this idea of they didn't only work mechanically for the Couturier, but they also bring ideas and techniques that played a key role in the development of Paris as fashion capital. And I will take one example. Uh, everyone knows uh, Elsa Schiaparelli and one of those sweaters that she created during the 30s. And this was an important uh, uh, design for her and she was very famous for this very modern sweater. And in fact, when we study, when we rely on the archives, we discover that she, was, she didn't invent this sweater. This was in fact an Armenian immigrant, a Ruslag Mikhailion, who worked for Elsa Schiaparelli and who has this wool techniques that Schiaparelli maybe didn't have or didn't, didn't uh, use. And this is because this worker brought these techniques with her that she, that Elsa Schiaparelli um, could, uh, has developed this very famous sweater. So I could continue like that with other examples, but I think we don't have time today. But to sum up, I think uh, we could think about this idea of exchanges in fashion we can think about transnational construction, and we can't forget uh, how migration within the fashion industry had a major impact on the business and geography of fashion. And I talked about migration of individuals, but we also can talk about uh, exchanges in techniques, in fashion press, in style, how, how style from Paris went to London, and maybe in Italy, and how all these style were in fact, um, uh, yeah, interbred. Uh, Okay, I just for And so, just some question to end, uh, to conclude. Uh, I think we can really talk about, okay, the, the role these migrants play, but also which techniques did 
which skills did the immigrants bring into the French culture, which technical, artistic, aesthetics and cultural elements did they transfer to the French industry? And the question is, how can we quantify this, what these immigrants, con contrib what is the immigrants' contribution to the French industry? And I think it's very necessary to quantify that to question the, this myth of Paris fashion couture. And I think it's, it's something uh, that we don't do, don't do often in France because as we also, we all will say today, French couture is very French. It's like a very national topic. But I think it's necessary to open the field and study uh, these exchanges. Thank you, Thank amazing. You. That was so fascinating, so I'm desperate to find out about the Armenian who gave Scabarelli yeah. the idea for the sweater. Um, what was the most interesting example that you came across in your research of that intermingling, the immigrant influence in French culture? What's the most interesting to you? The most interesting thing is that, yeah, uh, I think in Paris there was a fashion exhibition on Paris and immigration uh, four years ago. And in fact, the, the question of the exhibition was immigration. But when we saw the exhibition, it was more about fashion. But because I really think that the link between immigration and fashion is not easy. It's mm -hmm. not easy maybe in France because of the context, political, economics. It's not an easy question. And what is important is to, to highlight this relationship. And it's not because fashion is very important. I think for me, this is the most important is to question this link mm -hmm. and not just to say because we, also, we can also talk about Kenzo and the Belgian from Antwerp uh, in the 80s in fashion, yeah. but we, can't, we have to make the difference with these migrants, which come from economic reason, political reason, mm -hmm. and we can't, and this was the case in Paris, we can't, we can't mix up the immigration waves. We have to question them. Why did they come? Uh, why, how did they come? Because this is a fashion history, but this is also an economic and social history. For yeah. me, this is this yeah. very, um, this is what is important. When you say about. it's not easy to accept, why do you think it, it's not easy to accept because that? Because we influence? are very proud of, <laughs> of, our, of ourselves, yeah. and we are very proud of French uh, culture, and this is like an, in our identity. Mm. And it's yeah it's, yeah, it's very important. Yeah. But the way you're telling it makes it sound like you're reconstructing that history and finding it much more interesting and vibrant, yeah, actually. because it's a question of... I think the human component is fascinating. Yes. It's a question of human and it changes. And not only about just wonderful designers who invented yeah. everything. And I think when you study fashion through the scope of human individuals, for me it's very fascinating to see what people br brought to this industry. I, I think we're going to hear more about that, actually, probably from Caroline, I suspect, too. Let's hand over to Farid. Me? Yes. No? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I caught him unaware, so I did that on purpose. <laughs> okay, I, I am going to talk about a uh, um, very um, um, uh, strange question, which is uh, the sexual status of uh, the couturier at the time of Christian Dior. So after the presentation of uh, Oriol, um, at the end of the presentation, she, uh, she, made some, she made some evocation of this question. I would like to spend uh, um, a few minutes on, on these topics, which uh, um, is more um, a succession of questions for me than a, a succession of answers. So I apologize for, for that from the very beginning. Um, um, Let's start from uh, the beginning of everything, America. And uh, this is a magazine of 1955, a magazine uh, which is uh, basically uh, re re which was basically read by by men. And there is this extraordinary title, uh, "That Friend of Your Wife's Name Dior." So um, this this um, uh, this needs some explanation. The point of view of the magazine and of the writer is um, to take the point of view of the husbands. We don't talk enough about husbands in Dior's collection, so it's the time to do it. Um, the point of view is the point of view of the husbands, um, which is quite uh, rare at that time, and especially with that type of 
very strange way to put things with words. Um, otherwise, um, at that time, we have to go back in the 50s. In the 50s, I mean, men did exist. So sometimes there were interviews in the streets to have their advice about the other part, the woman, and so about especially the outfit. So most of the time, it was a, the, the answers were a mixture of uh, indifference and comprehension and some kind of attraction and approval, but always with a gling of, uh, I don't know, a gling of, anyway, a gling of irony. Uh, so some kind of ironic approval. Um, what men say about women outfits? I mean, this is still a subject to be docu documented for the 50s and maybe for today's also. Okay, so let's, let's go back to the explanation of the text. That, friend, how to understand that word? Uh, it is though uh, that uh, friend was a third character, a third person walking his way into the intimacy of the couple. There is a stranger in the house. You've maybe experienced that kind of feeling. There is someone in the house. In the house of the couple, there is someone walking in. And the, this one is Christian Dior. He is certainly the first one to have, uh, to have provoked that kind of uh, feeling uh, which has never been really identified as far as I know, uh, in the press, in magazine, maybe in memories or maybe in uh, private correspondence. This is another job for the, another life. But uh, so, and this, uh, this uh, working his way, the way he works his way, it's a source at the same time of irony and anxiety. There is a kind of anxiety in this uh, title. That friend of yours wife named Dior. Oh. Um, uh, this is, if I, we are, I'm going to translate that in a very uh, everyday uh, word. Um, this is the man who dresses you your wife. If you put this in, a, in these terms, it becomes some kind of uh, frenetically dangerous. Uh, this is a man who um, dresses you your wife, and it is a message sent to the American male. Uh, and uh, uh, a part at that time, apart from the husband and the doctor, as far as I know, there was no so many men who had access to uh, the woman body. I mean, the access was not, it was not a free access, uh, especially it was sometimes uh, not free, uh, uh, an expensive access. But um, so uh, this title, in fact, uh, showcases a kind of uh, very powerful fantasy. A fantasy, a uh, fantasma, fantasma, yes? A fantasy. A fantasy of uh, sexual promiscuity or maybe uh, sexual uh, 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 proximity or uh, an ev sexual event, a sexual event. So there is some kind, something which is unspoken in this title, but we can read through, uh, through the title. And uh, there is an, an, another, another message which is also unspoken, but it's also an open secret. So we have to decide today if really it was an open secret at that time. The secret, the open secret is in the mind, unconscious or conscious of the, of the American male who is reading that, that in fact, this friend is not a man. He's a friend, but he's not a man. Why is not a man? Because he is homosexual. So, which is a great relief. <laughs> it's a great relief for someone who is a normal husband. I am a normal husband. So I, I know. <laughs> I know why, what they felt at that time. So um, he's homosexual, he's, so he's not, uh, he's, not, uh, he's not anymore in danger. That this, he, so there is a name for that. At that time, there were no names. It's, it's in a prehistoric prehistoric time when the word gay didn't exist. 
at least in France. The word gay arrived in the 80s, the, the end of the 70s and early 80s, and it was a big change in terms of ter terminology and of perception of things, but this is another subject. I want to show you something. Uh, I want to show you an extract from a, an interview of Christian Dior, if you mind, if, if my chief mind, okay. <laughs> uh, it's an interview from 65, like this magazine, of Christian Dior in a very uh, popular program called Person to Person. It's right, a good title for the subject. Uh, person to Person, and it's an interview of Christian Dior. He's in his New York apartment, and he is uh, talking, he's being interviewed viewing by this uh, journalist, and they are talking about his charms. He has a lot of charms, a lot of, yeah, a lot of charm. And, and uh, there is another subject, I want you to, to discover it, I don't want to use the, the, the word. Will be some important new color. Well, good luck next week anyway, though I'm sure you won't need luck. Do you believe in it? Oh yes, I am very superstitious. Would you like to see all the charms I wear with me? Yes. Look here. There are two hearts there. Yes. Here, some lily of the valley. Mm -hmm. A four-cornered glove. Yes. A coin, gold coin. And there is a star who is probably the most important of them. Yes. And naturally, I have always a piece of wood in my pocket to touch it when it's necessary. <laughs> Tell me, is, is that one of your own ties you're wearing? Yes, of course. I would be a very, very bad businessman if I would not wear it. <laughs> well, Mr. Dior, um, you're about 50 years old and still a bachelor. Could this yes. mean, perhaps, that uh, you know women too well? Ah, uh, you know, in my house in Paris, I, I have about a thousand women working. And you know, that, believe me, it's quite enough for a home. <laughs> uh, tell me, what sort of woman appeals to you most? Oh, for my case, personally, I prefer medium-sized women and rather brunette. Uh-huh. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Dior. Okay. <laughs> okay, but it's just to give you um, a, a, the feeling of the very uh, uh, puritanical uh, uh, um, um, surrounding uh, which can explain that kind of question and with this, this very uh, cryptic uh, language vo vocabulary. Are you a bachelor? Everybody, it's a double language. So I don't know exactly how many men at that time in America uh, could, could understand it was a double langu language. So maybe we could have a scholarship uh, <laughs> for, the, for, for that. But anyway, there are two, two, thing two things which are important in this presentation by Dior. The fact that he's a wizard because he has all these charms. It sounds like an anecdote, but it's not an anecdote. So he's a kind of a wizard. And the other thing is that it's a wizard who has thousands of wives. So that makes a, you know, you can make a lot of things with that. It's, it's a good start in life. Okay, <laughs> anyway. So this is, an, again, uh, Christian Dior with uh, the petite main, the seamstress, which they are not afraid of him, you know, the big, the big wolf, she, she, they're not afraid of the big wolf, and they are just, and it's, I like this, this image. Anyway, uh, sorry. Uh, and uh, so, uh, what, what, what can we say after that? What is the situation? Okay, the situation is there, is this. It's a script, it's like a scenario. There, is, there are three characters. There is a wife who is apparently heterosexual, the husband, who is uh, heterosexual, and the couturier, who is, who is homosexual. And it, oh, the whole thing sounds like there was some kind of unspoken contract between the three of them, some kind of unthought uh, partnership, if I may speak like that. Uh, anyway, there is a, a kind of silent, mute partnership about what's going on between these three, in, inside this triangulation. And this, in this triangulation, the couturier dresses the wife, adorns her for the delectation of other men. And, but he never touches her, and he never desires her. Uh, is in, in a way, is uh, the master of uh, the outfit 
uh, the female out feet ceremonies. And, uh, but so that's an, an image of that. You see, uh, Zeus, there are certain numbers of pictures which are like cliché when we see the couturier with little wand. So it has practical reason because you can't spend your time touching things and things, I mean women, and, you know, so you can do that. So you have to, you know, it's like you, if you want to point out some details, technically speak, see, speaking, it's a technique uh, outil. Tool, tool, it's a tool. But at the same time, at the same time, I'm sorry to say that because it's evident, but it's a magic, it's a magic wand. So the, 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 in the images, in the iconography of uh, uh, Christian Dior, there is also this premeditation about the ambiguity of the wand. A technical tool, but at the same time, a magic tool. So this is important. But that doesn't mean that Christian Dior never touches women. He does sometimes. Especially some, some, this one is very, I like this one. And uh, you have three steps in the scenario. Uh, and this woman is not anyone, it's Jane Russell. You've heard of Jane Russell? Yes? So she is, um, she, it's, a, it's an American uh, uh, woman, and she was uh, um, very famous for the generosity of her forms, and, the, and especially her bosom. So, and there are, this image is very interesting because you see the three steps, and here and here is almost really touching the bosom of, of, of the star. But it's all right because this is a part of the woman which is, which is supposed to be uh, media, uh, glamorized. And so there is of kind of, this kind of uh, uh, the, gaze, the male gaze, uh, what we call the male gaze. So this is, very, and they, they are taking pleasure to play with that, as you can see. But it is as though, uh, in fact, the subject of the photography was not really the star, but what the couturier does with the body of the star. So, so this is an, another, another thing, okay? And so, uh, I'm, I'm almost finished. So this, triangular, uh, this triangulation could be compared could be discussed also, uh, to another scenario, which is the court love scenario, the medi medieval court love, amour, amour courtois, you know what I'm talking about? The court, well, and which uh, has three, um, uh, three uh, people, uh, there are three people working in the scenario, the king, the queen, and the knight. And the knight. Where is the knight? Anyway, the queen, uh, the queen and the knight, in French we say, the chevalier servant. You know that expression, chevalier? It's uh, the knight servant, and I found this other translation, the knight in shining armor. You, you know what I'm talking about. So, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very strong uh, scenario in the history of uh, court love in the mid medieval. And maybe, you know, sometimes someone like Yves Saint Laurent, someone like Yves Saint Laurent, sometimes people have talked about him as like as a chevalier servant of the modern woman. But he's not, in that case, he's not, he doesn't touch her, so, okay, we agree with that, but, but he's, he's a kind, he's, he's a companion of the modernization. He's a companion of the modernization of women. And, it, and, and the husband say, okay, <laughs> I don't know how to say that. <laughs> okay. okay, anyway, so, so, if I want to put it in another, in another, with other words, I would say that, in fact, um, um, the, the, the couturier is the one who organized and showcases uh, the, erot the erotic offer, the erotic offer, the erotic market uh, between sexes at a certain moment. So, I like this, this, this expression of erotic offer, which is a mixture of uh, erotism and economy point of view, this, this idea of market. Okay, and uh, uh, anyway, this, uh, sorry. So two last remarks, two last remarks uh, to add uh, to this uh, thing. The first one is uh, the, this um, very strange place which is within, within a, a maison couture called the cabine. 
Maybe you've heard of it. The cabin is a, it's a room. It's a very clo closed room inside the Maison Couture. Nobody never goes. Nobody goes there, especially from the outside, except the couturier, the little man, the couturier, the seamstress, and uh, people from here and there. And that's where live, during the day, the models. That's where they prepare themselves uh, to be showed uh, during the show and to be showed and to present the dresses to the clients. So they spent few, many hours, maybe four, five hours every day there. there and this is organized, it's a closed room, and there is a, a woman who is in charge of that and who is uh, uh, regulating the relationships between this, this woman. And this place is very, for instance, in, in Dior, this room is still existing, but they, it's used as a, as a, a, a storage, yes, as a storage. It's amazing because it has of kind, there is of some kind of uh, something uh, sacré, what do you say? Yes. And uh, so, uh, so each one has, each one has a, a own table and an own mirror. So this is also a place that could be uh, um, documented. And there is, um, you know, there are uh, an étage, a, a floor, there is a fur floor. So, and this is the cabin. But the cabin has another, another meaning. This is the other meaning of the term cabin. It means the teams. That means all the, all the, the community of the model working for, for the, the team is called the cabin. So the cabin is not only the place, it's also, it's also the team of women working as model. So, uh, and the, I really like this, this picture uh, because it's... Um, it's, uh, it tells a lot about the, the time, because uh, as as, uh, uh, as Oriol I saw, has told you, uh, Christian Dior is uh, um, maybe I, I, I be more radical is 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 a couturier of an hyper femininity, or, uh, uh, which is a woman who is uh, already prepared when she walks in the life in life. She has everything the dresses and the accessories. So she, she's a pure artef artefact, a pure artefact. And in fact, my idea, it's not a great idea anyway, but it's the idea that he is homosexual and he's inventing it's also, it's his own vision of uh, femininity. And this vision of femininity at that time in the early 50s is very close from what you could see in Trondvestai's cabaret. In, pa in Paris and in Montmartre, where there was, there was a kind of reborn, born again, not born again, but, uh, you know, a re a re sorry? Re re yes, uh, in reinvention of, of, of transvestites. So that would be interesting to, to see how all those two universes work together. And finally, the, the very important question, what women at that time thought about this? what women thought about the fact that they were dressed up by a man who was homosexual, who didn't desire them, but would, would uh, dress up them to, to please the heterosexual men. Is it clear? It's a little complicated. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I've worried so much to cover. I think um, anybody who works in fashion, certainly, and people who, like me, who look into fashion from the outside, would recognise your account of that world as a magical space with wizards and chivalric knights and fantasy and magic. It, it is, it seems to us. And it's, what's interesting to me is that when that, that slogan that you flagged up, that, that friend of yours, your wife named Dior, you said that there's an anxiety, that friend of yours, which is dispelled when you realise that the designer is a homosexual. But that if your nationhood is bound up with a particular idea of fashion, then it means that it can't be a secure idea of nationhood. It has to be queer, it has to be magical, it has to be fantastical, it has to have the possibility of men dressing as women, it has to have transformative possibilities. It seems to be really interesting that if f fashion is French, then it means that French nationhood has to be weird and magical and chivalric too. 
Well, not really in the everyday life, but, <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, yes, I, uh, no, what you say, I like the idea when I was listening to you, uh, and I was thinking that, like a lot of countries, it's a big train with a lot of people work, uh, working in, in the train at different uh, stations, mm -hmm. and others going out, mm -hmm. and you know, and in the train, like in the Indian trains or Chinese trains, mm -hmm. there are a lot of stories happening mm -hmm. from one wagon to another one, so... Uh, but it's not an, a real serious answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody can answer it, but I think that, that I think the picture you've given us of what happens in fashion, which is not just a superficial domain, but it is a place where you can play with identity and ways of Yes, being. but there is a it's real important. question. The real question here uh, is, is how come women are fascinated? What is yeah. the sources of fascination of, I mean, it was, uh, in the case of, of Dior, the fascination was absolutely, and as you mentioned, the first year was very difficult because, uh, uh, because uh, in America, in France, uh, in France there were problems. Uh, uh, a model mm -hmm. was attacked in the street by uh, by uh, the menagère, uh, comment dit les menagères, housewives, housewives, and things like that. So, but the key, th I think, the key problem. Is uh, for me, it's, a, it's, a, it's something very difficult to, not to understand, but to put together with all the other elements. Mm. How does it work, all that, fa this fascination, you know? Mm. I won't say that it's uh, uh, the, the, I don't want to think, because I think it's too hard to think that, that it's in fact the very famous contract between the slave and the master, mm. because this is an option, but, um, okay. But it, yeah, it's more complicated. It's, it's a little, more, yes, yes. There's a more traffic between the two. Traffic, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a good one. We'll come, we'll come back to it, I think. We must. Um, Caroline, over to you. Okay, thank you. Good evening. No, no, I'm <laughs> delighted and entertained. Um, so I do my best to follow from that great talk. Um, so, I, in fact, I am going to talk about a lot of the same issues, but we're going back in time. Uh, I'm going to talk about them by thinking about mostly the 18th century, and then I'll look back to the 20th at the end. Uh, oh, what's happening? Oh. Ah, here we are. So, this was the question that kind of popped into my inbox. Um, for today's <laughs> talk, and um, I read it, and I thought, well, obviously, no, it's not. Uh, it's also Japanese, it's Swedish, it's Nigerian, it's a whole host of other nationalities. Uh, but in fact, what I wanted to do in this talk is instead of thinking, in fact, about the diversity and the range of, of fashion across the world, is actually to question the idea of national fashion itself and to ask what we might mean by that. So could it be something that is actually autonomous, um, discreet, culturally isolated, or is it more likely to be perhaps a bit like food, something that is a hybrid, um, that travels culturally, that gathers meanings and flavors and textures as it goes? So over 2,000 years ago, the Silk Route brought not only silk but other commodities from China to Europe. Uh, and along the way, people bought and sold those commodities. They made goods out of them. They sold them on. So we have already built into the structures of fashion a kind of degree of hybridity that then often gets solidified as a kind of national myth. Um, but really, the key point is that fashion is intimately connected to international trade and that questions of style and national identities are profoundly rooted in money, uh, in commerce, and also in the geographies of power and influence. So, um, as early as the 16th century, Europeans started to, to classify fashion um, really by national type. They produced um, albums of national costume, which are very much a kind of rhetoric of us and them. And this is an Italian, Vecellio, uh, and he included European dress significantly and also a small amount of Asian and African dress in his book. But it's really important to look always at who is making this representation. Is it a representation of your own culture, or is it a representation of a foreigner? And that's really what I want to look at in possibly quite a light-hearted way um, in some of my images. But first of all, here's a great one from the 18th century. It's as if they'd invented Excel in the 18th century. I love this illustration. 
Um, so you might see far over on the left, the Spaniard, who is hopeless. I mean, 200 years out of fashion, terrible. Next to him, the Frenchman, possibly the most fashionable, very elegant. And you'll see halfway along, I think it's about the fifth, the Englishman also has that very English, kind of understated, sober, uh, different type of, of tailoring. He's wearing boots, not breeches, um, that is going to become very influential across Europe. And moving you know, geographically, I think we move geographically across Europe too, because at the end we get to Turkey. So I think this kind of linear grid-like structure reflects a sort of west to east kind of interpretation of national difference. Um, Yeah, let's look at the next slide. So here again are two representations um, of Frenchmen. On the right, it's one made by the French. Uh, and sorry, these are Englishmen, I should say. So you've got Frenchmen dressed in the English style, um, as the caption to this print says. And on the right, you've got Englishmen dressed in the English style. Um, so you begin to see some of the kind of hybridity and exchange that is going on. And this idea of the Englishman's dress is very influential in France, and it predates by many decades the idea of the English dandy that then becomes epitomized by Beau Brummel. But Anglomania starts much earlier than that in France. Uh, another example would be um, this three-collared coat. It's a, a design that originates in London, but it's equally fashionable in both London and Paris. And you'll see it's worn here by the Frenchman with a muslin cravat à l'anglaise. Uh, and then I'll show you just one more example uh, of a kind of hybrid fashion. So these are actually German fashions originating from Leipzig, which is a very important center for fashion at this time. Um, it's also the city in which Goethe's Sorrows of Young Werther was published. And I think that also, that idea of those fashions has a really important influence at the time. But the reason I chose this picture is because you can clearly see the influence of French fashion in the formal dress at the top uh, and of the more understated English style uh, in the walking dresses that are at the bottom. So, so far, so hybrid, and there are lots of other examples that I could have found. But what I want to do now is just go back to that idea of types that we have in our lovely 18th century Excel sheet that sort of stereotypes in this grid form uh, these national types. Because what you see is that types very rapidly become stereotypes, uh, and nowhere more so, in fact, than in the medium at which the English excelled, uh, which is caricature in the 18th century. So this is actually an English representation of an English type, um, the macaroni or fop, who is a sort of vapid, empty-headed man of fashion, you know, terribly overdressed. But I wanted to draw your attention to the sort of um, covert foreignness of this fop. Uh, first of all, he's called a macaroni, a type of food that um, upper-class English men would have encountered on their grand tour of Italy. And as we know, pasta, of course, comes from China, so we're back again to the sort of looping in of foreign influences that then become naturalized, if you like, in the sense of national food or national fashion. Secondly, the actual stylistic origins may have been French fashion, but they're quite likely to have been from Nabob, so it's very rich men who came, Englishmen who came back from the East India Company in India, bringing this incredible sort of kind of orientalist sort of wealth and luxury and richness. So again, there's all sorts of kind of ideas of foreignness that lurk below the surface in what is essentially a sort of quintessentially English kind of representation. And then, moving on, um, by contrast, how do the English think of the French? So here you have in this print the bluff Englishman walking in Paris with his stick, contrasted with this very uh, effete French aristocrat in a coach with his powdered wig, and then various French stereotypes that are created. So if you go from right to left, you can see the very uncouth peasant. There's a fat monk, oh, <laughs> priest, no, monk. Um, and my favorite, actually, is the figure on the far left, who is a hairdresser, who is so effeminate he has a parasol. You can see his scissors sticking out at the back. It's a little bit cropped. 
Um, so, I, I, I mean, I apologize in these sort of difficult times for showing you a sort of, I hope we're all kind of big enough to be able to cope with this sort of appalling stereotypes of otherness uh, that I'm going to show you in these slides. Uh, another example of a sort of... <laughs> The horror of French fashions in London is this lady whose, whose um, wig seems to be knocking this man off his chair uh, and terrifying the animals. And another example of a French fashion, this lady has a whole formal French garden on her head. Uh, it's a parterre, it's not an English garden by no means, and you can see it's got a little gardener and a gate and everything. So it's all pretty bad. Um, and this, again, is um, dedicated to the heads of the nation, but it's a satire on the French. Uh, the women have these very overly large and elaborate um, Apollo's knot hairstyles. The male dandies have these ridiculous hairdos, and they all have a sort of very foolish style of moving. La Poule is a reference to a kind of barnyard strut of this sort of dance that they're doing which is the quadrille, which I'm afraid is a French dance. So, moving on. Um, of course, uh, the British don't have the monopoly on stereotypes. Um, here's a, a French fashion plate, and you can see how um, incredibly um, uh, refined and kind of elegant and decorated and, and extravagant are the French women's fashions, the two figures on the right as opposed to the really strange-looking English ones on the left. So that middle figure in the grey has a sort of Puritan collar. I don't think that's accidental. Uh, and the woman to her right is almost 16th century in the fashion she's wearing. There's a very clear uh, difference made, and I think you can see it reflected also in the images of the men from the back. I think that's an Englishman on the uh, left, sorry, and the Frenchman on the right. So, um, looping back now into the 20th century, um, I think the really important point I wanted to make, uh, and the more serious one, is that these ideas of national fashion are not purely cultural and they're not purely social. Um, even before the wars and the revolutions of 18th century Europe, um, they're rooted in the real economics of the fashion industries of each country. And France in particular, um, in the 18th century, um, had a very strong luxury goods industry. I mean, even before the era of mass production, it exported luxuries across Europe. Um, and it was a commercial and as well as a cultural imperative to sell itself, this notion of itself, to the rest of the world, this idea of Frenchness as intimately connected with luxury goods in the 18th century and then from the mid-19th century, as Sophie talked about, with the emergence of haute couture, which is essentially an export industry. And I think that's something that people in this country very often don't understand. They think it's just posh clothes for rich women. But it was absolutely crucial for France to sell the idea of Frenchness through haute couture um, to all these other buyers, so such as Britain or America, who were really buying for their internal markets. Uh, so they were importing those ideas. I mean, there are structures to the industry which make it very different from other ones, but that's essentially, uh, I think, the important point. So these stereotypes carry on into the 20th century. So here you have a, a French Illustrated Weekly um, personifying the difference between the French woman and the Anglo-Saxon woman. So you can see, again, the French woman is wearing this very elegant lampshade-style tunic, pioneered by Paul Poiret. She's got something that's almost like an aigrette. She's got tiny, dainty steps in the description. She's got very small, small feet. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon, by contrast, is kind of bigger. She's wearing a masculine tailor-made. And even though it's just a cartoon, you can see her skirt, her thigh, straining against the skirt as she takes these big steps. Uh, and there's a lot of... I, I did a lot of work on fashion modeling in this period, and there are so many descriptions of the differences between the French walk and the American woman's walk. Um, and I'll just give you one more example after the war. This is just before war. So after the war, in a really brilliant publicity coup, uh, Jean Patou imported uh, six American models to his Paris catwalk, which is a sort of provocation, really, to the industry to suggest in France that... American women could do better, something that French women are supposed to be so famous for and so good at. 
Um, Patu, I think, was a very clever marketeer. Um, he claimed that uh, in order to sell, because to, America by then was the biggest market for haute couture, for, for um, clothing that was going to translate into factory-made clothing. So he claimed he needed this, what he called the American Diana, uh, so the huntress, the, the tall and slender Diana, as opposed to what he called the French Venus, who was supposed to be uh, more curvaceous, more petite. So we're obviously trading in cliché here, and it certainly isn't borne out by his cabin of, of mannequins, who were of all nationalities. Uh, and they clearly weren't as standardized um, as he wanted to make them look. I'll just show you one more picture. Um, so those are the American mannequins. Um, the writer Colette went further in French Vogue. She calls the French models sturdy French ponies. Uh, and the Americans, she said, were like a squad of archangels poised for flight. So even a writer like Colette seems to be trading in these stereotypes, it seems to me. Uh, and they really weren't borne out by the nationalities in Patu's cabine. Um, so to come back to the question of is fashion only French, well, obviously it's not, because fashion is never only one thing. Uh, national identities, I think, are not fixed but contingent. Um, but they're also determined as much... Uh, by how others see it as by any intrinsic characteristics. I mean, in fact, it's a bit more complicated than that because within haute couture, I think, the French have to make a story for themselves, for the French, then they have to make another story of Frenchness for export, and then the people who buy those clothes in other countries make a third story of Frenchness to sell to their local markets. And all of these accounts of Frenchness are bound up in the commercial necessity of buying and selling goods across borders. So um, I showed you some pictures of 18th century ideals and caricatures in fashion, both English and French, and I showed you some 20th century examples. And although these stereotypes, as they become, often position French and English identities as inimical, I'd like to suggest that in reality, they are in fact hybrid, plural, and even sometimes opportunistic, because each borrows from the other when it suits them. Um, but at the end of the day, they are a representation, and as a representation, they are a, a type of cultural construction and an economic one. Thank you. Thank you. We, we, we must hurry on soon, but just to ask quickly, in that story, I know that these are types or cliches mm. that you are saying are more complicated in reality, and there's traffic, there's exporting, mm. importing. But in that, in that relationship, do the, the, do the English always come off worse? Are we always less graceful, more blocky, more...? Well, I think it depends who's representing us, doesn't mm. it? Yeah. But I, it, it's hard to imagine the French have it going through a phase of anglomania um, <laughs> right now. Yeah. I think we should ask a French person, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I think we we'll can have... ask so few. <laughs> I think we'll have an opportunity. Should we hand over mm. to real Anglomania, Mary Quant, with Jane Lister. Lister. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to talk about a very British stereotype, um, Mary Quant. So as a brand known for bringing designer fashion to the high street and democratising style, borrowing from menswear for women, Mary Quants make, makes a very obvious case study for this discussion. So as she said herself in 1966, once only the rich and the establishment set the fashion. Now it is the inexpensive little dress seen on the girl on the high street. These girls don't worry about accent or class, they are the mods. And starting in 1955 as a small London boutique called Bazaar on the King's Road in Chelsea, she initially sold a mix of knitwear, hats and accessories. I'm sure you know all this, but anyway, sourced from London wholesalers together with jewellery made from school, um, old art school friends um, that she had known. Um, sorry. I love this image. It's um, actually Mary Quant in the centre of her coterie of models in Manchester rather than London. Uh, which seems important to say as well. So soon, um, in the 1950s, customers demanded to buy copies of Mary's own very distinctive clothes, like sailor dresses or, or schoolgirl pinafores, which she wore um, while working in the shop. And very soon, she made some of these clothes at home, and her cottage in industry eventually built into this huge licensing business over the next decade. 
Um, she designed Mary Quant branded raincoats, shoes, fur coats, underwear, makeup, even dolls, and later duvet covers, carpets, and kitchen equipment, all made in factories around the whole of the UK, branded with her simple but effective Daisy logo. And I think clearly this relates back to Dior's licensing model as well, um, which Mary Quant obviously also kept very tight control of too, but she was obsessed with factories and obviously a very different idea to couture. So her style was also right from the start, quint quintessentially British, catering for the bohemian social mix attracted to Chelsea and also deliberately satirizing and riffing on British tweeds and other fabrics and also historical st stereotypes such as the city businessman or the Norfolk jacket and breeches, sort of referring back to the past and these kind of British colonial um, stereotypes. And by 1966, the date of this photograph and this dress, the Chelsea look had, become to, had come to symbolise the ideas and the youthful attitudes of swinging London. The dress shown here is called Rocket Romper, and that for me epitomises Quant's radical approach, taking, literally taking a child's outfit, sizing it up for a grown-up, and selling it across the UK and beyond to over 50 countries, um, including North America, of course, and Australia and Europe. It would have sold for about seven guineas, which is actually still quite expensive. It would have been about twice the price of a, of a Marks and Spencer's dress of a similar type. So Quant's success was rooted in the existing infrastructure of the British ready-to-wear industry. And British fashion exports already marketed very much using the widely understood icons of British culture, such as Big Ben or policemen or Chelsea pensioners or telephone boxes. And these images I'm showing here um, suggest this idea of marketing quant clothes by hamming up these ideas of Britishness and being sometimes deliberately provocative to appeal to those who wanted to reject everything old and traditional. And um, a strong theme that you see when you look into quant's clothes is this idea of subverting menswear. Um, she called things like Bank of England or Eton College these very quirky, fun and cool um, clothes, which, which kind of um, later epitomised what was called the youth quake. But this idea of, of subverting menswear um, kind of parallels the way in the 1950s and the 1960s, increasing access for women to education and some kinds of work was happening. And Quant's clothes both express and promote the struggle for equal opportunities. Quant herself talked about fashion, how it, should, how it was important, it wasn't frivolous, and how it was empowering for women who were increasingly working and in professional circles. And by appropriating traditional Savile Row tailoring with trousers, collars and ties, and she kind of camped up these traditional gender roles and also the class system. And she used humour to create new kinds of femininity in the early 60s, leading to the miniskirt, of course, and later more unisex fashion in the 1970s. She also played upon um, the idea of English eccentricity. She talked about this a lot. And alongside the very practical and masculine or minimal styles she promoted, she also reinvented Victorian dresses and traditional children's clothes, designing pretty styles sometimes, often using classic Liberty prints or the traditional wool flannels um, that Britain was famous for, but often she would persuade manufacturers to dye them in really bright colours, like bright yellow or this bright orange. And it's actually this red dress I love because it's almost taking a Victorian red flannel petticoat and making it into this really fun kind of maxi dress of 1964. And it's interesting to think about how the French perceived Mary Quant. And so I looked very hard for magazines which wrote about Mary Quant. And in 1963, she... Um, she had this very important event, a fashion show in the Hotel Crillon in Paris. So um, London was already showing its ready-to-wear industry in Paris, and um, at this time, in April 1963, Mary Quant was invited to show her own designs. And she wrote about it, how, um, how crazy this fashion show was. Her style was very different to the kind of static, grown-up way that fa Paris fashion was marketed marketed, always very energetic and fun with music and jazz um, for Mary Quant. And so her, the way she went down was, was obviously quite shocking in um, traditional couture circles. And the, uh, the programme for her um, fashion show talks about how audacious it was to be showing British fashions in this way in France. And I think the article in, from, 
from the French Elle magazine is interesting too. And it very rough, very definitively positions Mary Quant as a media stereotype for the kind of, as a beatnik for um, the bohemian and arty student look. We can't avoid talking about the miniskirts, of course. And so increasingly, uh, Mary Quant became known as a media star and a kind of influencer of her day. And she became the, literally the face of the miniskirt, which evolved actually from the late 1950s. But at the same time, Paris couturier André Courrèges was promoting trousers and short skirts for his often very wealthy clients. And in the past, Courrèges has often been credited with inventing the miniskirt. But in reality, I don't think anyone did invent the miniskirt. I think it was schoolgirls and young women, people dancing in clubs who improvised the style first. But according to newspaper coverage, I think we can really say that Mary Quant was very much um, responsible for popularising the miniskirt. And perhaps the ultimate opportunity for photographs came when she collected her OBE medal for her contribution to British fashion exports. She was conspicuously dressed head to toe in all of her own products in a wool jersey mini dress complete with white lipstick. And the Daily Mail and other newspapers commented on her unconventional clothes at Buckingham Palace and how she stood out. Um, they also talked about things like she didn't have a handbag. And, but it was very clever of her, actually, because she kept to the rules. She wore a hat, she wore gloves, but she kind of subverted them in a really clever way. And, of course, images like these were, so, were syndicated to newspapers around the world. So a strong theme in the exhibition of, as well, of course, is this idea of liberated fashion. And looking back from 50 years later, in 2012, Mary Quant felt that the miniskirt was an entirely positive development, saying it was the most optimistic, look at me, isn't life wonderful fashion that had ever been devised. And of course, um, she didn't actually claim that she'd invented it either. She felt it was almost like a child that she had been given um, charge of and been made responsible for, but it was actually much bigger than anything she could have created. And certainly from our perspective, um, and at the time, it was pushing at the boundaries of taste. It gave some women the ability to retain the precious, precious freedom of childhood and a confidence and a freedom of expression. And this reflected the slowly relaxing attitudes to sexuality of that period. Of course, the pill had come in in 1963, but it wasn't widely available, so it actually took a long, much longer time for, for those kind of um, effects to really make an impact. Um, but perhaps from now, in, 19, in 2019, some of these fashion images that we're looking at here don't really give the impression of, of freedom of expression. It could certainly be argued that they create another oppressive stereotype, the impossibly skinny or infantilized and available dolly bird. So while preparing the exhibition, we've been talking to many women who wore Quant's designs to see what they meant to them at the time. And the focus of the finale of the exhibition is an immersive projection featuring over 50 photographs and personal quotes from our recent call out to the public for garments, memories and family photographs. We show a whole sea of self-defined quant women from all backgrounds and ages. And many of these told us how they saw quant as a powerful role model who gave them an, an individual style of their own, kicking against the constraints of middle class respectability. So some examples perhaps would be Susan, a lady called Susan White who wore her quant mini dress riding her moped through the mill, mill towns of Lancashire, much to the dismay apparently of the local community. And also Sue Nicholson who horrified, this is a quote, horrified her conventional domestic science teachers by using her Mary Quant dress pattern for her O-level exam. So to conclude, the Mary Quant Cam the We Want Quant campaign, a social media campaign we did, this helped to underline the power of Mary Quant's brand and her deep connection to the consumers who identified with her attitude, even by buying just a lipstick or a pack of tights. The authenticity of her brand is something that fashion labels aspire to today, but it's hard to think of a current designer who embodies a similar mass appeal. And to return to the original perhaps a provocative question of if, is fashion French? Um, I think perhaps Mary Quant helps to pin down the point when fashion really, obviously, it's always been transitional, but I think we can really see how fashion was transcending these traditional boundaries on a very global scale at this point in the 60s. Of course, this revolution would have eventually happened anyway, without Mary Quant. She was lucky to have the backup of her husband's talent for marketing and their business partner's skills for finance. And also, of course, she was lucky to find herself at the heart of London's thriving post-war creative scene. 
But Mary Quant's unique personal qualities, her striking classless name, her distinctive looks, which were, of course, perfect for demonstrating the miniskirt, together with her intelligence, her humour and drive, I think this ensured that she alone became the figurehead of the future of fashion. And that's where I'm finishing. Thank you. Thank you. The, the show is a joy. If anybody's not been, it's, um, you can't help but come out uh, with a spring in your step. Um, do you have a sense of what the French response was to Mary Quant? Yeah, I mean, the newspaper articles you see, um, I think they're kind of fascinated by her. Um, I haven't, I've only seen a few. There wasn't, like, mass coverage in the mm -hmm. way that we had in Britain. But I'm sure her response is seen in designers like Emmanuel Kahn and mm -hmm. Dorothy B, another brand, I think, mm -hmm. who obviously took this idea of youthfulness and street style and kind of disrupted the haute couture system a bit. Yeah, thank you. We're, we're totally going to run out of time, so I'm going to open to the floor immediately. I think we've got about ten minutes. Are there questions? There are. There's one in the aisle there. Let's take that, and then I'll take some more. Once they come up. So the middle are on the right hand side. There's a mic coming to you. Thank you. Um, just the question that we, we, all of you have been talking a lot about um, female fashion, French female fashion, and uh, is, what's the status of um, the same for men? Is it, I mean, nowadays, because you talked about uh, earlier in the 18th century, but uh, mm -hmm. is there such a thing as is men's fashion French or not <laughs> at all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any takers for that? Well, I, I, I suppose I could jump in there now because of my last slide, which was Kim Jones, who of course mm -hmm. is, you know, an Englishman at a, at a French house. Um, there, you know, when you look at the sort of French menswear now, I think menswear has had a huge resurgence of interest in the last sort of five years, ten, five years. It's really become a focus for fashion. And actually, a lot of people say it's, it's where it's at. You know, it's leading and it's the most interesting place at the moment. But I think it is a much more international story because as, as we, I think we mentioned here earlier, you know, Britain is always traditionally seen as the home of Savile Row, the home of tailoring. Um, you know, when tailoring comes in in the early 19th century, there is this fascination, you mentioned Beau Brummel earlier on, that idea of immaculate dressing and cutting to shape. Um, but I think, you know, and, and certainly in London, men's fashion um, weekend or, or, you know, men's fashion collections have become again in the last five years quite a focus. So I think internationally it, it's definitely everyone looking at menswear. But I don't think it's particularly French. There are wonderful French designers, but I, I don't think it has the same link um, compared with women's fashion, you know, that, that very um, strong link to Paris as a city. Yeah, I agree with that. Mm. I think, in, in fact, uh, maybe we could say that uh, uh, there is two traditional big uh, uh, poles, poles. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the sartorial pole, which is, uh, which is uh, the, the quality of the production of the bespoke ideal, mm -hmm. and on the other side, the sprezzatura, Italian, yes. um, yeah, the, yeah. the grace, the, the, the art of wearing uh, the bespoke tailor, yeah. the, yes. the big, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. 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 This, this is, in fact, it's the Protestant uh, tradition and, and the Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. And now there is also, uh, uh, which is something very important among the, 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 the main market, which is the streetwear. Yeah. And the streetwear, with the streetwear, we have, you have all sorts of brands coming in. Virgil Abloh, mm -hmm. uh, Supreme, mm -hmm. uh, all, uh, all, these, all these brands who are basically either American, either um, com people coming out of nowhere from the East, like uh, Vetements, yeah. Zazalia, yeah. and who are Gosh. really, who are not sportswear, yeah. but deeply street yeah. wear. Yeah. Yeah. Like and uh, so this makes a, yeah. maybe I think the, the the landscape is like that and some kind of very sophisticated uh, 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 cross be with um, uh, with software uh, with sportswear. Yeah. This is what Kim Jones is doing yeah. at yeah. your yeah. Uh, yeah. mixture of sophistication and uh, and uh, London street heritage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a brilliant answer. Um, and uh, more from both of you. Um, is there another question? There is one over there. Thank you. Hi. 
Okay. Um, to what extent have designers such as Christian Dior uh, inspired uh, modern fashion, like 21st century fashion? Sounds like an Oriel question. Um, <laughs> I, 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 it's actually interesting for us because we've been working um, very closely with the current designer at Dior as, as, as well as the historic pieces. Um, and so the current designer there, Maria Grazia Curie, just to take you know, one designer in a sense, she um, really looks at Christian Dior's original designs and has reworked them. So she takes out the stuffing, she takes out the padding, she looks at the skirt and uses like a light tulle instead mm -hmm. of a, a heavy wool. And a lot of the people um, who've gone around our exhibition have said that they can really see the very strong link of all of the designers. There are seven in total who've been at the head, um, officially at the house of, of Dior. And a lot of people comment that they really see you know, this, this influence. Um, also, a lot of people have said that looking at Dior's original garments, how timeless they look. Um, so that a lot of them are really quite wearable today. Um, so I think at the moment, it is, it, you know, it, it's a look that is certainly working. Um, and I think Maria Grazia Curie is, is certainly pushing out those codes <coughs> and those um, sort of, those styles that we know from the House of Dior. So I think it's, it's certainly, um, you know, it's a cyclical thing, I suppose, but I suppose at the moment it is, it is in fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Are there more questions? Um, so at the back there, and then we'll come to... The that was all really fascinating, thank you. Um, I've been very conscious for the last several years that French fashion is so influential for us in Britain and I know in America it is a, as well. As well, um, I say in my stripy shirt. Um, I was wondering if any of you have any thoughts on the British fashion identity and the way that if um, a French style and a French way of thinking about our wardrobes, about capsule wardrobes, for example, is so influential. Um, if that might have an effect on British style, particularly in London, and the kind of individuality that we have here, now mm. or in the future. Mm. Jenny, I wonder if you've got thoughts mm. on that, thinking about your work on the London look. And yeah, um, I just think fashion now is so open and it's down to the, the individual. You can express yourself in a way that, I, obviously I'm biased, but I feel that Mary Quant was one of the first to kind of show that the ordinary person on the street could express themselves um, and perhaps that's a kind of London thing I don't know it's a certainly a street type, street style thing mm -hmm. um, I think it goes down back to the in a way that the, the fact that menswear is very British in terms of history as well and I think there's crossing over of styles um, women and men wear you know different almost the same thing sometimes um, so I think it's very yeah. open yeah Sophie and Farid, I wonder if you think that walking around Paris, do you think oh, that's a very London look? Does that ever happen? No. <laughs> we tried. <laughs> Would you say traditionally there is maybe more of an acceptance of the individual in, in British society, of that stepping outside mm. of, you know, wearing the, the sort of accepted uniform of clothing or fashion? Um, that's often a notion that we talk about, that idea of the eccentric, maybe, yes, the individual. Yeah. That is quite strong mm. in the, the history of, sort of British fashion and approaches to dressing. And maybe that's something that really feeds into street style here mm. too, and that you look at different periods. I've been looking um, recently at the early 80s and how you know, the, the sort of club scene here became yes. so important. In the 90s, of course, you know, people like McQueen, Alexander mm. McQueen, really important. That, that very sort of individual... Unique yeah, approach, I, maybe. Yeah. No, I think okay. during the sixties, it's it was the case because we were. It was the beginning of the end of the uh, importance of couture in France, mm -hmm. and we were, we are a little bit late in France in the development of ready to wear. And mm -hmm. Br Britain represented at this time, you know, the the power of the young people, of the freedom, and I think in the fashion, French fashion press we can see British as a model, like, mm -hmm. oh, look at Marie Crant and look at like, all these British teenagers, mm -hmm. they propose something where, something else, a new way of life, a new way of uh, wearing clothes, and meaning something with their clothes. Mm -hmm. And I think for France it's, it's, it was a very, very important to see that, you know, the countries, we, we, the couture, um, the met to measure was 
maybe from the past and that the future of fashion uh, was uh, this new uh, uh, young, young, young mm. fashion. Mm. Caroline, I know because you, you hang out with very cool kids at Central St. Martins. I wonder if I you just look teach at them. <laughs> I don't hang out with them. <laughs> she does. Look at her. <laughs> oh, wait. We had to drag her. But I just mean, when you look at your students, is there, and is there, do you, I, I know when American students, I see American students, they often say they're slightly stunned by how um, daring mm. British, or British style can be. And I wonder if you have a sense of that. Are you talking about fashion students? Yeah. Though? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think they are. I, did, I also don't know how typical our students yeah. are amongst fashion students, let yeah. alone amongst, you know, a broader population of yeah. people in that demographic, that age group. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I find it quite difficult, actually, to generalise about yeah. these yeah. styles. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've seen some wacky students. Um, there was one more student, uh, one more question, sorry, and then I've got a final closing question. Was it you there? Yes, thank you. Thank you, that was such a fascinating talk. So in the kind of 20th century, we see this emerging idea of sort of modernism and futurism, which is often associated with masculine traits. To what extent would you see kind of cutting edge fashion and Mary Kwan and, um, you know, the Dior idea of, sorry, the Chanel idea of the modern woman as facilitating this idea of modernism for women and that becoming an idea that modernity is actually becoming associated with women. And to what extent do you think Dior and kind of the new look was antithetical to that and maybe inhibited it a little bit? How, what, to what extent did these trends facilitate mo modernity for women and were empowering for them? Hmm. It's obviously been something we've been looking at, you know, people saying, oh, Dior put women back in corsets and, um, you know, the woman back in the home, that idea in the post-war period. And it's just been interesting discussing that with a lot of women who wore Dior. Um, one of Farid's um, uh, slides showing the cabine, the lady at mm. the front in the green dress, Svetlana, is um, someone that we've spoken a lot with because she's um, alive and well and wonderful. Wow. And she... Um, I think people, I mean, she sort of loved wearing Dior. She talked about it, she thought it was wonderful. Um, and she'd grown up in the war years and she just loved this idea of glamour. And, and so for her as a young girl, she was very drawn to it. She wasn't aware maybe of the fact of, you know, older people and certainly those women holding those slogan signs saying, we abhor your dresses to the floor. You know, women who had lived through the war and had freedom and realised that these, these clothes were restrictive and referred to them as, as going back to the days of their grandmother. Um, but there is this sort of cyclical thing of this younger demographic who want to wear those clothes, who love the idea, but, you know, it's, it's sort of a reaction to what's gone before. And another woman who said to me um, recently, she donated this amazing evening dress with boning and corsetry inside it and she said to me oh it was the most comfortable dress I ever wore mm -hmm. and I thought you know obviously you, you felt that at the time because you were probably wearing other corseted garments and things but actually now you know sitting there in you know our stretch clothing we all wear today or whatever it, it, how could that be true so I, I think it's yeah, it's a difficult question to answer really I mean obviously visually yes we can all say look it's it, you know it's setting women back but hearing individual stories and how people reacted to it, I suppose that's why it became so popular. I, I think that your point is a, um, a really good one to do with the emancipation of women uh, across the 20th century, because if you look at the history of change in dress styles, there was a, a generally a kind of masculinization of the female wardrobe, like we wear trousers now and no one says that, you know, we've got hairs on our chests which they did at the beginning of the century. There hasn't been an equivalent feminization, really, of the male wardrobe. I mean, there have been things like soft Italian tailoring, but essentially we still have the 19th century suit as a sort of generic kind of masculine dress type. Mm. And that all makes perfect sense to me as women are trying to assume power in the workplace and in other areas that you would want to occupy the kind of dress language of power, if you like, and engage with it. But then the question is, and this is why it's an interesting one, because it's unanswerable, is, you know, is it really so powerful to dress as a man, and why should you have to, 
Uh, and Vivian Westwood famously said, I'm not interested in putting women in sort of making women look like second class men or mm. sort of something like that when she designed her mini crinny. So she was much more interested in taking those signifiers of hyper femininity and making them powerful for women. I mean, whether you think she did or didn't, I guess is for mm. you to interpret. But I think it's a sort of endless debate that one circles around these very fixed notions of gender uh, in relation to what we construe from them as, as somehow powerful or not powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, a really good answer too. Uh, just uh, uh, what I was thinking about this, this teller in New York um, who... who, who, who no, 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 it, no it, it's, it's uh, I don't remember his name. It's uh, uh, in, in, in Brooklyn and who, who is making suits only for LGBT. Oh. Yes. Ah. Yes. Yes. And there is a movie about it called Suited. And it's interesting to see that this formal costume, yes. which mm -hmm. has not changed, which express nothing, mm. uh, uh, and this equality, this mm. no, no personality, is used as a, uh, yes. a, a basis of expressing something by different... Uh, mm. uh, um, yeah, absolutely. Mm. So it's all about the graphs. Yeah. Yes, but I just mm. I wanted to say that in fact it's not only masculine, masculinization, as you mm -hmm. said. It's it's more it's a little more complicated. In fact, now women have two world worlds. Mm -hmm. They have yes. two world yep. worlds, and yeah. men have one world. Yeah. So You're right. So it's it's not the yeah. same. The yeah. opportunities are very different. No, I agree with you. So and uh, I agree. so the story is not uh, yeah. masculinization. It's two world world on one side, yeah. and just one. On the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're right. <laughs> um, I hope we've given you, you? lots. <laughs> I hope we've given you lots of wardrobe ideas. Um, I had one last question, just very, very quickly. We've been talking about France and Britain and how porous those national borders are. But I wonder where you think, beyond France and Britain, where the f fashion frontier is, where the most exciting work is happening. I think at the moment we've been looking a lot at Lagos in Nigeria oh, and wow. just seeing the, 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 the very, I mean, over the last few years, the emergence of the African fashion scene and how sophisticated it's got in the last few mm. years. And I think that, for me, is really exciting. Yeah. That's yeah. It. I see. I, I think there is a new, it's not a new fashion, but a new way of seeing at fashion, it's, which is the legal fashion of, uh, of uh, fashion with all this uh, uh, issue of... Uh, uh, cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. which is becoming to be very important and in a way which is re-bordering the territory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, re it's re-bordering mm -hmm. uh, territory. Maybe you could explain in English, I can't explain yeah. what is... Re yeah, that really reinstating well. no, but, those old borders. But what, yeah. what yeah. is it? Uh, maybe nobody knows, uh, but people don't know what it is, uh, the cultural appropriation of fashion tradition by, you know, uh, for instance, Ethiopian uh, yeah. uh, couturiers, uh, they, uh, if a French designer uh, use an Ethiopian motif, uh, yeah. but, but yeah. texture or uh -huh. design. So uh, um, now, now people are claiming again against mm -hmm. this exploitation of a national tradition. Yeah. So and it's get and, and it's get it's it's becoming a, um, juridical. Yeah. Um, yeah. juridical yeah. issue. Yeah. So, it's, so there is something very... Yeah, yeah and that's maybe why the last um, Dior show, yeah. uh, Maria Grazia worked very closely with an anthropologist on, yes. fashion, on African textile, yes. and she worked with really African workers to use uh, African... Or uh, maybe African textile doesn't mean a lot, but so, so Africa country textile, and she closely worked with them, and it was very maybe for the first time it was really working with the popul local population and not just taking uh, their style. And, but it's, yeah. but it, it's, and it's, it's it's not a guarantee that it is right. No, yeah. no. It's yeah. not. It's it's just a guarantee that the. All, all paranoiac. Yes. That's, 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 that's different. It. No, that's yeah. different. They do it because they don't want to be attacked. Yeah, yeah. They don't do it because they really want to do no, something no, for these poor people. No. 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 But she worked with an anthropologist for the yes, first time. Yes, yes. So okay. maybe we can <laughs> imagine that. You can't wash, well, you yeah. can't wash your hands with that expectation. Colla collaboration yes. is, so, is so hard. Um, but, but not between the British and the French, obviously. We've had a, <laughs> such a triumphant event. Um, please could you join me in thanking our guests, and I'll let you get on to our next event. Thank you very much for your questions.